Here is more of a scholarly question, uh, but very poignant as it relates directly to the transformative times that we're going through as a whole, as a humanity. So here's the question. I'd love to hear your view about the radical shift deepening that Sri Aurobindo initiated. I'm missing a conversation about evolutionary mysticism and time, sadly absent in the contemporary spiritual discourse, totally centered in the fetishization of the now. Well, we've kind of uh, touched up on the second half of the question in the talk with Rick on the bad gap and the uh, in relation to the concept of time. But I think the question is um, kind of inseparable from that second part, so we'll take it another go at it. Well, my, my own personal actually journey is uh, inseparable from the name of that great yogi, because the very first book that shook me to the core um, was the book written by Sri Aurobindo's disciple, French man, under the spiritual name Satprem, who whose life was kind of like very much the reflection of the tragedies and atrocities of the 20th century. He was in a concentration camp during the Second World War and found himself on, you know, in, uh, in India searching for the answers to the perplexing questions of life and death. And that drove him to Sri Aurobindo's ashram, where he became a mystic in his own right. So on returning to Europe, he was writing and you know, teaching, translating works of Aurobindo. And um, the first book I, wrote, I, I read in my late 20s, uh, I think it was still in Russian, actually, was uh, the book by Satprem. And it was precisely um, the book on the main theme of Sri Aurobindo's teaching the kind of integral cellular transformation of humanity from individual to the collective. And those two are inseparable. And in a way, uh, that could be traced deep within uh, some of the most um, amazing traditions of the Orient and Occident. But it is with Warabindo this whole quest was brought to the very modern platform. In fact, I think he superseded uh, the discoveries that are only taking place in the last, let's say, 20, maybe even less years. The discoveries uh, in neurosciences about the you know, neuroplasticity of the brain and how this whole jelly-like structure is being rearranged through the consciousness that is obviously the driving force behind all the processes in the body. So going back to Aurobindo, he is kind of like the first properly modern sage, as it were. Although he was deeply steeped in uh, the tradition to which he is one of the greatest heir, the message of Sri Aurobindo is radically different than what you would find, let's say, in the you know, um, contemporary uh, teachers of, of his era, not of that particular slot of time, but let's say like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa or Ramana Maharshi or even Swami Brahmananda Saraswati, you know, uh, whose grace we um, receive directly you know, on the level of the heart, you know, Maharishi's master. So the Sri Aurobindo's message was a kind of departure from that uh, overly uh, mysticized, overly kind of like overloaded with uh, mythology, you know, the Puranas and the Upanishads. Uh, you, know, the, you know, he was the first one who made an attempt to purify, to prune Vedas from all the unnecessary weeds before Maharishi made the next step. But I'm not going to kind of go towards the scholarly analysis of, of the masters. 
what interests uh, me here personally is that an amazing breakthrough that Sri Aurobindo did with his integral yoga. And please, just a little uh, footnote, let's not confuse the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo with the integral yoga uh, currently being uh, kind of promoted by the Ken Wilber and um, his disciple, I uh, forgot his name, um, I beg your pardon, I think he's going to be interviewed uh, with, you know, on this program. Um, Andrew Coyne, sorry, he's the director of the Integral Institute in the United States at the moment. This, are, you know, although the Ken Wilber claims that his ideas were a kind of um, taken from the ideas of Sri Aurobindo, yet he gave Sri Aurobindo its kind of uh, critical gloss, I believe personally, and I'm not alone in that respect, that Ken Wilber overly simplified and kind of uh, almost consciously or subconsciously misinterpreted the original ideas present in Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga in order to present his own you know, modern system, you know, based on quadrants and what have you. Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga is deeply rooted in the Vedic tradition. Yet, as I said earlier, it has been purified from all this sort of um, century-old um, deposits, you know, like layers, the dust, you know, like the superstition that was accompanying the Vedic practices. The superstition, you know, that even among the Brahmins who were supposed to be the custodians, the carriers of the tradition. What Sri Aurobindo did, he actually brought to light the essence of the Vedas, the essence of the, actually, the whole of the, um, you know, spiritual tradition that comes from that particular part of the world and presented it to, the, to, the, to humanity in a very new form. Although he spoke in that kind of, you know, old English Victorian language, and it is very, you know, um, it is very Baroque language, you know, it's got kind of like quite hard to read for a modern reader, especially for someone, you know, who is, let's say, um, 10 years younger than me, you know, because this is, uh, the language which constantly, you know, operates with various um, idioms that are no longer kind of found in, in English language as, as such. However, there is this underlining modernity that is really striking. And what do I mean by that word? The modernity in terms of almost acutely feeling the coming of the age when the science will reach the stage of its evolution, the Western science, where it will completely, completely merge with the mystical, experiential traditions of both East and West. So that way before Maharishi, Sri Aurobindo already spoke of the necessity to understand that our human DNA itself undergoing a trans a radical transformation. He pre predicted there would be a, almost an, a flood, an avalanche of awakenings. You know, he was the one who was talking about this whole um, very, very um, seldom understood notion of karma and the problem of rebirth in his famous a booklet, and his famous, not a booklet, sorry, in a, fa in a famous essay, in the, the, it's actually, I think, called Karma and the Problem of Rebirth, where he reformulated the notion and the concept of karma in the new language, where the karma is seen no longer as just a cause and effect, you know, like you've done and you would have to reap the benefit, the, benef the benefits or the repercussions of, one, of your own actions but in a grandier, in much more cosmological kind of uh, perspective, where the karma itself, you know, is the karma of humanity. It's the karma of the planet. It's a sum total. It's a sum total of all the heartbeats, all the desires that were swelling this planet from the moment that 
uh, human being started to actualize himself in terms of uh, in independent entity on this planet, since the fall, basically, you know, since the fall from the paradise. So the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo also uh, intimately linked to the Vedic concept of time, the Vedic concept of um, Manvantara, the Manvantara, you know, the cyclicity of time, the time itself is a pulsating reality. Time is not a static or not an illusion. It's not something that we perceive or have no perception of and it happens on its own accord. It's neither mechanical, no rational, no logical. It's beyond that. It is a pulsating reality which has rhythm of its own. It has breath of its own, its own expansion and its own contraction. And those manvantaras, you know, the, the yugas, the ages that form the, let's say, the lifespan of a particular aspect of consciousness, you know, seen in the Hindu tradition as Brahma, Vishnu, you know, Shiva. So it's like the, 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 the trinity of this whole of creation, you know, the creation, the sustenance and the dissolution is being seen in precise mathematical proportion in relation to life of its own and time is that entity which allows that vibration of the matrix to experience itself to the degree of its fluctuations as it goes to the periphery and goes back to the center so they let's say go back to the idea of the ages the idea of the yugas we live in time when it is considered to be the most the most contracted state of consciousness. Consciousness in its current state contracted to such degree where it no longer knows itself as it were. So ignorance is not just ignorance here or ignorance there. Ignorance is prevalent. It's not just ignorance among the human beings. It's the ignorance of the elephant and the ignorance of the tiger. The ignorance of the whale and the ignorance of the elements. It's not just the ignorance of human being is ignorant, but every other creature is, you know, playing in accord with the laws of nature. That is only partial picture. The full picture of this whole concept of ignorance or avidya is that the laws of nature themselves are shrunk to itself, to themselves. The laws of nature are being obscured, obscuring the consciousness itself. Sorry, the the. Um, unmanifested part, the unmanifested part, is being basically concealed to such a degree that Dharma itself is no longer on its feet. So the, you know, that the notorious proportion, you know, that in the golden age there is 100% of natural law manifest throughout, and then it starts to diminish, you know, the Bronze Age, 75%. The iron, you know, the, the copper age, it's only 50%. You know, the birth of language, birth of religions, the birth of the necessity to keep that structure, to uphold this structure. And we are at the time when consciousness fallen down to itself, to a degree when only 25% is present and 75% is overshadowed to itself. So this is what Sri Aurobindo was already initiating and Maharishi Mahesh conclusively brought to light. So that concept, that concept also has its own energy. And that reality, that reality of time, you know, so the time we live in Although negative as it seems, as there are plenty of manifestations to believe so, to confirm that notion, has its own value. And the value of that is that it can no longer contract. It has to expand. That is another inherent quality of consciousness. So this is the time, this is the time when consciousness at its experiential leap and 
obviously there are those who talk about who are you know talk about the doom and gloom and the possibility of nihilation of this whole of creation or at least on the level on the scale of the human existence on this planet along with the planet and perhaps there is you know something to that you know but those of us who see into the light who are in the presence of the light have a profound understanding that the inherent quality of consciousness is shining forth then the evolution is inevitable and this process that we undergo currently is being actually palpably felt and it's not just mental shift keep repeating that you know this is what also uh, i find very very uh, tuning you know to the let's say the ideas of Sri Aurobindo is that he was the one who for the first time talked about cellular enlightenment he was the one who was talking about cellular transformation the transformation on a cellular level and if we are to see where the current breakthroughs in neurosciences are being made you know we are you know like it's pretty amazing what is happening you know the body is no longer seen as this kind of uh, inert Uh, corresponding reality of the mind it's actually inseparable indivisible They, you cannot cut the body there's, there's no place where you can actually cut and say this is the body this is an organ you know this is the bone you, you, it's impossible whenever you cut the body it's consciousness at all its levels and at all its layers and that's what we've been doing you know prior to that prior to current explosion and expansion we've been dissecting matter dissecting matter only to find that there is no such thing so the evolutionary mysticism that as the question itself sort of uh, in brackets puts so absent in order and so focused on the fetishization of the now you know like as the questioner um, exclaims that it's you know the, the dialogue is absent yes it is maybe absent on the level of the millions of books sold by Eckhart Tolle you know but you know this book helps people perhaps people who are at that level you know who need to have that shift and i know many people who have read the power of the now and then they've tried to implement that as kind of uh, the ultimate understanding in their lives only to realize that this is actually uh, a just a wake up call and not not an awakening itself it's just to rub your eyes and you know it's like time to wake up but it's not at all a, a recipe for uh, being awakened it's not a, a guidance book either it's just a book for our time or the message for our time however overly simplified you know and, um, not going to um, discourage people from uh, let's say getting into that kind of Uh, inquiry but I'm not going to encourage them either and I can see that that what is absent in on the surface let's say of on the spiritual uh, on the surface of the spiritual circles let's say this discussion yet it is present deep within deep within that understanding is present the understanding of much greater much greater forces the energetic transformation that taking place the transformation on the level of the human dna the human dna undergoes its transformation and that is being the subject of discussion of many many progressive scientists mystics and um, those who had let's say the capacity and the ability to experience it, to experience it first hand So I think it is maybe absent in the overall sort of surface dialogue. But I don't think it is absent in the core of what is happening now because that will contradict the very nature 
of the very, let's say, uh, prophetic message of Sri Aurobindo. Because we are now living in time that Sri Aurobindo was talking about, the time of the transformation. And it is happening. And it is happening on the level of ourselves.